All right, we open this book every Sunday, no exceptions. We believe that this is God's book. It's his authority. He wrote it through humans who lived on different continents, years apart, 40 different men, um, different languages, but it all miraculously came together to form this harmonious whole that says the same thing through beginning to end and points to the rescue mission of God to rescue us through his son, Jesus Christ. There's nothing else like this on the planet. That's why it'll always be God's book. It'll always be reliable, trustworthy, and authoritative. And you can put your whole life on it. I promise you that. You can do that. And I don't mean to make light of your questions, because I have questions about this book. I'll tell you what, I read it all week. I have more questions than answers sometimes. And I'm supposed to get up here and pretend like I have something to tell you. I got a lot of questions. I just want to tell you, if you have questions, that's okay. God can handle your questions more than you think. God can handle your questions. So we're going to jump in the Word today, and I like to have fun. I'm not irreverent with the Bible. I just like that it meets us where we're at, and I don't shy away from that stuff. The Bible talks about stuff that sometimes people don't talk about in church, like death, sex, uh, divorce, struggles, just the stuff that we think about, money problems, and we don't shy away from that. So we're going to read a real Bible passage today. Is that okay? All right, here we go. I'm going to say a prayer. God, thank you for your word. God, thank you that you're real. You're not just a fairy tale off on a dusty shelf. But God, as we open your word, you really want to speak to each one of us. And God, thank you that you're not sitting there distant in the clouds, ready to strike us with anger. But you, you dealt with that on the cross with your son, Jesus. And now we get this thing called blessing. We get this thing called eternal life. We get this thing called joy. We get this thing called relationship. We just pray, God, that every heart today wouldn't miss that. and feel you tugging us closer as we open your word and learn about your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. So I'm going to read. But first, I want to ask you a question. I want an honest answer from y'all. How many of you believe in the concept of soulmates? Mm. All right, we're going to take a poll. You only get one chance, and there's no middle way. Like, well, I kind of do, but I don't want to give the wrong answer. So I'm not going to raise my hand. You have to raise your hand. First group's going to be, yes, I believe in the concept of soulmates. Second group's going to be, no, I do not believe in the concept of soulmates. We're going to take a tally and see. I already know what the internet says as far as what Americans believe. You ready for this? I can see you all embarrassed. You don't want to take it. You're like, can I be in the middle somewhere? No, you cannot be in the middle. And I promise I won't shame you with, a, you, got, you got it wrong afterwards. All right, here we go. Raise your hand if you believe in the concept of soulmates. Come on, all you hopeless romantics watching chick flicks all the time. Raise your hand as you stuff your face with popcorn and watch. Watch this one. All right. All right. Now I want you to raise your hand loud and proud if you do not believe in the concept of soulmates. You're like, uh-uh. No, not me. Don't even, don't even bring that baloney around me. You wipe that smile right off your face. I've done none of that. All right. Okay, so I saw a little bit more hands for the concept of soulmates, a few less for the concept of no soulmate. And uh, I looked on Google and I found out that it's about 71 to 73 percent believing in the concept of soulmates in America. Uh, 73 percent of men, excuse me, 73 percent of women believe it, 71 percent of men believe it. So women are slightly more gullible or believable in that concept. Sorry, that's felt like a dig. I didn't mean that to sound like insulting. Anyways, today when we read Genesis 23 and 24, we see the first, like, wow, we get to see the first shouldn't say the first. We get to see the biggest picture of a marriage so far in your whole Bible. The first time love came up was talking about these guys that love for their son. Um, we get to see the first death of the oldest woman, the only woman that the whole Bible tells us her age. Isn't that interesting? It tells us her age at her death, 127. That's Sarah. The, one of the only women that the Bible tells us, emulate this woman, follow her. Usually the Bible tells you to follow Jesus, emulate Jesus. But the Bible tells you to emulate Sarah. She's a good woman. The Bible tells us frequently that she's beautiful. Uh, the Bible tells us that she makes mistakes, but still she gets honored in the Old Testament, in these stories, by prophets later, and by the writers of the New Testament. So we should probably honor Sarah. We're going to read about her death today. We're also going to read about her son's finding of his spouse. I'm not going to say soulmate, but finding of his spouse. And it's a really beautiful love story. I used to read this story to people when I was single. I used to teach this story when I was single, and it really gave me a lot of hope as a single, hopeless Romantic kind of ish believing in the concept of soulmate that someday God would bring a person to my life I used to read this story and here I am teaching as a married man It's kind of a nice uh, to be on the other side teaching this story But I don't know. It's just pretty neat. I want to say a couple things about this concept of soulmate I'm not going to tell if you're right or wrong, but I'm going to say one thing The Bible doesn't teach that you are incomplete until you get married the Bible says it's not good for man to be alone in, in, con, in the context of Adam and Eve. It didn't mean that Adam was lonely and incomplete. And when Eve was brought into his life, it was to help him to follow God, know God, 
better and to serve the purposes of God. It wasn't because he was incomplete. I just want to tell you that you're not incomplete either. If you're single today, or you're divorced, or you are married and miserable, I just want to tell you, you're not incomplete. You're not incomplete in the sense that someone else needs to complete you. I want to tell you that if you're a teenager dreaming about finding Mr. Right or Mrs. Right someday, no person will complete you. The Bible doesn't teach that. The internet does, Hollywood does, but the Bible doesn't teach that. Most married people can raise their hand and tell you, yeah, it's kind of true. Marriage doesn't really complete you. It doesn't solve all your problems. It doesn't make you perfectly happy. And I need to be honest up here and tell you, I'm a happily married man. I'm a legit happily married man. I try not to rub that in because I don't want to brag, and I want to always point it to Jesus, but I'm a stinking happily, very overly happily married man. Very happy about it. Yet, I was happy before I got married. I was, and I made it my goal as a young man to find my happiness in Jesus, because I believe this book, and that's what it says. That's what I'm telling you. Some of you in this room, you will never get married. It's possible. Maybe someone listening online, you'll never get married. You're okay. You're okay, because Jesus, it's kind of cliche, cheesy, here I go. Jesus is your soulmate, according to the Bible. Jesus is your soulmate. I know it's cheesy. I wish I could have found a less cheesy way to say that. But the Bible doesn't teach that a person is your soulmate. It teaches that Jesus is. We become complete and whole and blessed when we know him surrender to him, follow him, are encountered by him. And that's what the Bible teaches. So I just want to say that today. Christianity is not trust in Jesus, now go get married. It's trust in Jesus. It's trust in Jesus. Uh, happily ever after. It's a big thing in like Disney movies. But man, if you're a Christian, it's happily ever before, happily ever throughout, and happily ever after. And I think a better word is actually blessed than happy. Because ha how many of you guys are happy this is fleeting? Happiness is based on like circumstances. Like, man, some days you know might not be feeling the happiness when your car broke down and this is going bad and you're sick. But blessed is different. Blessed is a deep residing feeling of joy that comes from God who made you to be completed by Him. Number two, before we jump in the story, the concept of soulmates, God absolutely does know the plans He has for your life. So here I'm kind of saying there's another side of this coin. If you're single and you want to get married someday, I really believe God knows the plans he has for your life. I really believe he planned your life before you are born. And you're not an accident, even if your parents told you you were an accident. Not according to God. You're not. You're not a scientific accident. You're not a sex accident. You're not an accident according to God. And your life is completely designed and planned by him. Yes, we still have a role in how things go. Yes, we still have free will and choice. And yes, that's a bit of a mystery. I totally believe God has a plan for you. And I'll say that if you're single and you want to get married someday, and you read this story, it gets you excited. That's great. You just keep surrendering that to God. Because I totally believe he has a plan for your life. Some of you are like, I'm old, I'm 40, I'm 50, I've been divorced. I'm not going to, how's it going to work out? You know what? These guys were old too, and things still worked out for them. They weren't teenagers. They were older. And things worked out. Isaac's about 40 years old. And he finds his wife. Never been married before, as far as we know. All right. Next thing I wanted to say is, number three, finding your soulmate is not the adventure of your life. It's not the purpose of your life. I, I really, man, I really felt like I was led astray by, like, all my movie intake and like I don't know, public school intake as a kid I just feel like it was so indoctrinated and brainwashed into me that that's like the purpose of life is to find your soulmate and like it's like the adventure to like find and I just I don't see that in the Bible and I just need to be so honest with you I hope this doesn't sound judgmental I talk to so many people who have a great love story of how they fell in love and found their partner and then they have a tragic story of how they fell out of love and lost their partner I'm just saying I don't think that's the adventure God made us for I think it's a part, I think it's included, I don't think it's the whole. I really think the Bible teaches us, like with Adam and Eve from the very beginning and throughout, the greatest adventure is to follow the wild adventure that Jesus designed for your life and to serve him wholeheartedly. And that's exciting. And I think if you're doing that, you'll look aside and there'll be someone running next to you. And that might be the person you marry. I said it's a little cliche, it sounds a little oversimplistic, but I really think that's the way things work in God's kingdom. Is we run after him on this crazy adventure called following Jesus, and everything else takes care of itself. I'm not saying we have no role now, I'm not saying we're passive, I'm not saying we just sit on the sofa and we're entitled to God doing everything we want. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you follow Jesus, and then he leads you. I really believe that. And that's the adventure. I don't, I don't want you just to think... You're gonna find someone and be happy, and then you just sit on the sofa and watch reruns of Friends the rest of your life, and everything's great. I want you to really be whole and complete. I'm not saying this to like, I'm right, you're wrong. I'm really, I want you to be happy. I want you to be happy. And I live 
We live in a society where people are not happy. Hello, do you guys talk to people these days? People are deeply unhappy. People are trying to find a wholeness in their heart. And Jesus intends that you who know him would shine his light to them and show them where true happiness comes from. So we need to be clear about some things. I don't want to just help people find their match. I like this story. It's fun that there's matchmaking. I had a matchmaker in my story. Someone introduced me to my wife. I'm forever grateful for that experience. But I hope you don't go away and say, all right, that's what the story's about. Time to do some matchmaking. There's so much more about our relationship with God. So I'm going to give you a summary of chapter 23, and then we're going to read some of 24. Chapter 23 is about the end of Abraham and Sarah's marriage. And it did not end in divorce, even though most marriages today in America end in divorce. Their marriage actually ended in death. Anytime divorce and death comes up, I like to just tell you, this is a church where there's no shame here. And some of you have been divorced multiple times, and, and all of us, none of us are perfect, so there's no judgment around that. That's not, if, if you're saying, I don't feel like I can go to church because I'm divorced, this is the church for you. This is the church where God redeems everything that we might be embarrassed about from our past. This is the church for you. Um, that being said, they stuck together through some rough stuff. I don't know if you remember, but we need to be really honest about what happened. Abraham pimped out his wife twice that we know of. Two other dudes. That was not God's plan for him. Abraham did some weird stuff. Sarah did some weird stuff too. She told him to sleep with their probably teenage maidservant employee so they could get a baby quicker. Guys, this is like Jerry Springer stuff, and it's in your Bible. The Bible tells us these are good examples for us. I'm just saying, if some of you are embarrassed that your life has some not so pretty stuff, so do the Bible characters. So we, we're in the same boat, friends. We're in the same boat. We are in the same boat. Anyways. The beautiful thing is chapter 23 shows us that they stuck through it. They lived a long time. I mean, Abraham's 127 years. He's burying his wife. And the Bible tells us Abraham's very blessed with his marriage. He's happy, but now he's sad because she's dead. He's, she's, he's grieving and he's mourning. Uh, they had a good long time, but still when you're together that long, it's really hard. I wonder how many of you have ever, some of you are familiar with that. Maybe you've lost someone close to you or you've seen someone close to you lose a loved one. Sometimes it's like, it's like dominoes. Someone else dies of a broken heart. It's hard stuff. I'm not making light of that. Anyways, Abraham and the... I'm just going to kind of wrap up what happens in 23 because I don't want to read it all. I think it's really to set the stage for 24. Abraham buys a plot of land in the promised land in the land of Canaan to bury his wife in a cave. The people called the Hittites, the sons of Heth, they uh, want to give it to him for free. But Abraham goes, uh-uh, I don't take discounts. I'm not that Christian who always wants a freebie and a discount. He goes, I want to pay the full price. He says, I want to do this integrist, and I want to do this courteously, I want to do this righteously. So he pays the money um, very generously, and he gets this plot of land in the land of Canaan, which you probably know is the promised land for God's people. It's a big deal in the Old Testament story that God's promising, promising them a land to come into. Well, this is the first time they actually own part of that land, is Abraham bearing Sarah. And Abraham makes a very shrewd and wise move there, because eventually he'll be buried there. Little does he know, or maybe he does know that. Eventually his son and his daughter-in-law will be married there, and so on and so on. So we come today to Genesis 24. You guys ready to read something together? It says, verse 1, Now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. All right, so let's set the stage. This is a blessed man. It's not just that he's rich, but he is rich. But how many of you guys know rich is not blessed all the time? It's rich and miserable. Abraham's actually really blessed by God. He's encountered God. He knows God. He's followed God. He's made mistakes. But God is just blessing him in every possible way. He's blessed. Yeah, his wife just died, but he knows he's had a good, long life and a good marriage. He has a son. Okay, so he's blessed. Verse 2, Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned. Here you go. Here comes classic Bible stuff for you. Please place your hand under my thigh. And I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife from my son, from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I live. But you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife from my son, Isaac. So what's happening here? Let's break this down. Let's unpack this. Abraham, he's old, he's blessed. His wife's passed on, but he's celebrating God's goodness to him. But his son is single. And his son's like 37, 38. His son's a good guy. How many of you guys remember Isaac went up the mountain and was literally trusting his dad enough to sacrifice him? They got a good connection going, <laughs> dad and son here. I'd say so. If you let your dad put wood on your back, take you to where they usually sacrifice animals, pull a knife up, and you're still like, Dad, I trust you. I know God's with you. They got a good connection going. 
<laughs> like, I don't let my dad do that kind of stuff to me, just to be honest. Um, so Abraham has this servant, probably Eliezer, because he's mentioned earlier in Genesis. He's a pretty good servant. He's a loyal servant. We call him an employee. But anyways, like the steward of the house. He manages everything. If you put someone in charge of all your stuff, true or false, you trust them. True. You trust them. So then you, Abraham has this plan. He wants to get a son. Abraham doesn't want to go get the son himself. Abraham doesn't want Isaac to go get his son himself. He wants to pick a servant that he trusts. Maybe God spoke to him and said, this is how it's going to go. Either way, he speaks to this servant and says, I want you to go to my country. This is the country where he left, where his relatives are. And it's curious because they're right here next to Canaan, this land that they want to possess them in. There's probably tons of nice ladies in Canaan, right? Maybe. And this is where it gets a little touchy. And this is where the conversation becomes not extremely politically correct. It's probably where we need to talk about why, why Abram's being discriminatory. Why doesn't he want him to go in? Is this racism? Is this sexism? Is this culture, ethnicity, judgment? Is this hateful stuff? Is this hate speech? What is this? Well, let me just tell you, God is no discriminator. And anytime you're trying to be nicer than God, you're failing. God is not a discriminator. God made every color. God made every people. And inside, we're all the same. How many can agree and say I? Yeah. yeah. But when it comes to marriage, I think discrimination is a very healthy thing. Picking your spouse, picking who you're going to date, picking who you're going to spend your life with. The Bible would tell you, yes, there is actually a healthy level of discrimination you are to take. It's not based on skin color, but based on anything like that. But it's based on certain things. And Abraham was really clear. I want you to find a wife for my son, not from these Canaanites, because they don't worship the God we worship. Friends, I need to be really real with you right here. Let's, let's have a real, real talk. Church, ready for a real talk? Yeah. Everyone you know who does not love Jesus is, has a big bullseye on them. For, uh, no strings attached crazy radical love from you you are God's channel of love to people who don't know Jesus no strings attached and no discrimination your job's not to judge people your job's not to uh, blame people your job's not to give them advice it's ultimately to give them love listen to them and point them to Jesus that's your job that's your job and we should get really good at this and this should be our passion as the church we should not be judging how people do sex we should not be judging how people do politics we should not be judging how people do money because if they don't know jesus they're not going to do it the same way you do they're not going to have the the same power they're not going to have the same convictions but when it comes to marriage when it comes to who you're going to marry or who you're going to date which in the bible dating is always for the purpose of finding who you're going to marry it's not just a, a social thing in the bible they don't even use the word dating it's something that came along in american culture later um, but in the Bible, in this idea of finding, you know, some people call it courtship. I don't really care what you call it. But in this exploration of finding who you're going to marry, the Bible absolutely wants you to discriminate. And please, someone who's single today, hear me saying, please, please, I beg you, discriminate when you're picking who you're going to marry. Please have some criteria besides they breathe air. Please have some criteria before, besides they took a shower. They smell half nice. They know where a church is in their city. Please tell me you have some higher standards. And thankfully, if you don't, the Bible has good standards for you. And even going back as far as Abraham, we can see that he passionately wants his son to find someone who will worship the God of the Bible, the one true God. Passionately wants his son not to mix with any other, even though they're probably nice girls, who are not worshiping the God. This is the one big thing. And I would say that to you with no shame today. If you're raising your kids... Man, and your kids are going to get introduced to Jesus. Please start praying for them regularly that God will provide a spouse for them who equally loves Jesus, who vibrantly loves Jesus. Not who's religious, not who can rattle off a few religious memories, but who actually has a vibrant walk with Jesus. Parents, start praying that now. Seriously, I'm so thankful, so thankful that my parents prayed that for me as a teenager, as a young man. Parents praying that for me when I didn't want to hear it as a teenager. I'm like, shh, I should keep talking about this. Stuff. Praying for me someday, God provide a spouse. I'm thankful they prayed for that. How many of you in this, this room? Thankful someone prayed for you, that you found a spouse who loves Jesus. And some of you in this room may be married to someone who doesn't love Jesus. We still pray for your spouse and we love them. Absolutely honor them because God has tremendous value for them. The Bible tells you not to divorce them, but to win them over to the Lord through honor and respectful behavior. Amen? Yeah, you're not a lower class church member uh, if your spouse doesn't love Jesus. Absolutely not. We love your spouse very much and we pray for them. And we're excited for them to join the family someday. Anyways, back to discrimination. Discriminate. Like, maybe I should stop saying that word. I'm just saying, that's what this looks like, and that's what this is. Is have some criteria. I'm telling you, there's some single people here who need to hear this today. You need to really have some higher criteria. All right. Let's move on to what is this swearing under the thigh happening? Okay, so let's be really honest. If you research this, that's not the thigh, it's the genitals. 
They are literally man-to-man -man reaching underneath and touching the most vulnerable, intimate, uh, gener symbolic of future generations area that has already been ceremonially, ritually circumcised to represent their covenant to God. And now they are man-to-man, -man, hand under hand. This is not thigh. Like, thighs are already a little awkward. I don't know about you. I don't usually reach for my brother's thighs when I want to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. This is more intimate than that. This is genitals. This is hand-to-hand. -hand. It's not something they're doing regularly. Uh, this is something they do on very, very special occasions when they need to make an oath. This is bigger than pinky promise. This is bigger than cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. This is like, we're going to seriously, on my life, on my future generations, make a covenant together. That's how important this is. Uh, somebody, I want you to see that that's how important this is to Father Abraham for his son. He's going out on a limb for his son. And I just want some of you parents to, to be reminded today of what passionate love looks like for your kids. Sometimes it really means stepping up to the plate. Sometimes we trust God and say God's got this one. Sometimes it means we jump in all in. Thankful a relationship with the Holy Spirit guides us want to know the difference. Amen? But um, this is when Abraham has the faith that he needs to jump in. I think this is really cool. Some people think this is weird. This is cultural. This is controlling. I don't like people making decisions for me. I'm American. I'm independent. I do things myself. The Bible doesn't always honor that kind of independence. Sometimes the Bible calls it foolish. Let's keep reading. So anyways... Yeah, Abraham has faith that this, he's got a plan. We have a strategy. I need you to go for me, my servant, and I need you to do this, but we're trusting God to come through on this one. And they set up kind of this fleece, so to speak. They want God to sh basically show them a sign. I wonder how many of you guys have ever said, God, please show me a sign. I don't know what to do right now. God, show me a sign. Anyone ever been there before? Uh, it's, I think it's okay if you get there, but we have something even better now today. As Like, we're reading from the Old Testament. But in the two-thirds of your Bible, it changes to the New Testament when Jesus comes on the scene. And then when Jesus dies and rises from the grave and sends the Holy Spirit to people to trust him, uh, you get this special thing called the filling of the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's the thing that makes you distinct and different from the people in the Old Testament. Is you don't just get a visit from God anymore and signs and wonders. You get the Holy Spirit inside of you. Amen. So that's good news. If you, I don't know if you ever read the Bible and you're like, gosh, I wish I could live back then. It would just be so much easier if I lived back then. No. No, it's easier now. I promise you it's easier now. You have a whole Bible to read. You have tons of people in churches who love Jesus and know Jesus. You can ask God to just come fill you with his Holy Spirit when you meet him at the foot of the cross. And you can learn to slow down and listen to his voice. You are in way better state, way better terms of this agreement than anyone ever was before. So you don't have to set everything up in your life like, God, show me a sign. I, I want to eat a donut. If there's a parking spot right in the front, I'm going to get a donut at the donut store. You don't have to do that. You can actually just say a simple prayer and say, God, I'm surrendered. I'm a little emotional today. I'm struggling. I'm thinking about eating. Please help me and tell me what to do. You can just pray simple prayers like that about anything in your life. Nothing's off limits to the Holy Spirit. It's not ashamed of, of your, your dialogue. But anyways, this is Old Testament. So Abraham's setting up this cool thing. I think it's really neat. So what does he say? He says, go there. He says, okay, God's going to send an angel before you. You're going to find a wife. And Abram said, and oh, the servant speaks up, says, what if the woman's not willing to follow you? Uh, then you'll be free from this. Oh, and he goes, sorry, I read that wrong. He's asking, uh, what, you know, what happens? Abraham says, but if the woman's not willing to follow you, you'll be free from this oath. Just don't take my son back there. That's all I ask. So the servant places his hand back under the thigh of Abraham, his master. You know, that's, that's private parts. This is... This is real, raw, and vulnerable. They are saying, we need to see God come through on this, and we're swearing our life on this, our future generations. Man, that's vulnerable. No, I think it's okay for men to be vulnerable, just so you know. I don't, uh, let's not go this far around here, <laughs> if, if I could just ask one, one limit. But I think, men, it's okay for you to be vulnerable. I just think it's okay. I don't think it's a sign of weakness. I think it's a sign of strength. All right. So here's where I wrote that I'm going to go on a rant. And you're like, Josh, you've been ranting a lot. <laughs> no, now it says in my notes, rant. So I have two rants. So one of them is going to be dialed down. One of them is going to be dialed up. So the one aimed at younger people, this one's going to be dialed up. Because the Bible tells me not to rebuke an older man harshly, but doesn't say I can't rebuke younger people harshly. So young people, tell, to put your seatbelt on and tell me if you're ready. Tell me if you're ready. All right, here we go. So sit in this seat with me on this roller coaster. I'm, I'm with you. 
Isaac didn't find his own wife or demand to go find his own wife himself. He trusted his daddy and his daddy's servant to take care of business for him. And probably one of the biggest decisions of his life, only second to choosing to follow God. The Proverbs are filled with comparisons of people who are wise and people who are foolish. And continuously, people who are wise want godly counsel, want advice, want feedback, want mentors, and find victory through that. And the people who are foolish are independent, a.k.a. American, who want to do everything myself, who want to do everything my way, who know that common sense will guide us to everything. And if I really need help, I'll just Google, because there's always 10 tips for anything I'm facing on Google. Young people, I'm just saying, sometimes we are foolishly independent, and we think we're just navigating, and we have grit and resilience, and sometimes we're not. We are unwise. And we wonder why we're always learning through the school of hard knocks. And we wonder why we're always learning through experience, rather than someone else's experience. And we wonder why it's hard to connect with the older generation. We always blame them for, oh, they're old, and they're bossy, and they don't understand me. I'm just saying, young people, I don't know if, if you were sitting here face-to-face with Jesus and he would say that's wisdom. And I love you, and I know I'm coming on a little strong, but sometimes I want to come on strong because you know I love you and I want you to course correct. And you need people in your life who have more experience than you. And young people, you need people in your life who will pray for you. And young people, you need people in your life who will listen to you and then counsel you and give you advice. That's the way of the Bible. It's the way of God. It's the way of God's kingdom. Not just because they're older, but because... It's God's system of honor. And if you honor people who have walked further than you and beyond you, you will receive blessings from your honor to them and their deposit back in your life. I just want to tell you that. I just want to tell you to do that. Uh, I, and I'm just reflecting on my life. I, I literally had someone match make me and my wife. And I think it would be really foolish if I said, thou shalt match make all marriages. That would be foolish. That's not the point. We're not making a formula for that. But I'm so thankful that there was godly people twice my age in my life when I was a knucklehead, 20-year-old, not knowing where to put, point my eyeballs. I'm so thankful. So many of you men in this room, you're like guardrails punching me when I was going about to fall off the path and do so many stupid things. I'm so thankful. I was in a church family. Not just my biological family, but a church family with godly men and godly women older than me who lovingly knocked me on the head so many times to keep me in line. I'm so thankful there are people to point, press me into careers when I didn't know what to do. I'm so th thankful people pressed me into uh, wisdom with all the major decisions I've had to make in my life. I am thankful. I'm not uh, boasting because I've done a lot of things on my own and then I learned the hard way. But then I usually come back and I'll oh, yeah, yeah, God, I remember. You want me to be wise and welcome feedback in my life. I just want to tell you young people, maybe some of you are kind of old and you need to hear this too. Maybe you're not too old and you can still learn this too but I just want you to be like Isaac okay now I'm going to rant on the older generation and I'm going to dial it way down you guys ready for this? you guys ready? because this is going to be way nicer than you're ever going to hear this from anyone but I just want to tell you just because you're old doesn't mean you're entitled to give people feedback Abraham earned the trust of Isaac and I want to encourage you old people you really do to earn the trust of people that you care about and old people I want to, I want to also encourage you to be Brave and resilient like Abraham. Look at this guy doing this crazy oath, putting himself out there. He's a blessed old man, 20, 127. As far as I'm concerned, he could go retire, go to Florida and collect seashells. But he's putting everything on the line, making some crazy oaths to find a wife, the right wife for his wife. I just wonder how many people you're investing in like that, older people. Just wonder how many of you older Christians still have that fire to give what God's given you and just pour it into other people. And honestly, I'm preaching to the choir because I know old people, older people, got to be careful how I say it, older people. You guys do that in this church. You guys pour into us. And I appreciate that. I just wanted to ask you to dial it up. And I'm telling you, people are coming to this church repeatedly, repeatedly and encountering Jesus and coming out of jail and coming off of drugs and coming out of confusion and coming out of religion and coming out of... Success in the world's eyes, and they need fathers and mothers who will love them and listen to them and hold them and not judge them and be and call them the second time if they don't call you back. We need you, older people. We need you. I need you in this church to help us love. One second. Let me get some water. My allergies started kicking in. I'm a little vulnerable up here. We need you. We need you guys. We need you to help us love this city. We need you. And young people, just because you're 30, because you're 40, doesn't mean you're too young to pour your heart and life into younger people and other people. 
And don't count yourself out just because you're 30 or 36 or 35 or 25. God might want to use you just as much as someone who's older. I'm telling you, age is not the biggest thing in God's kingdom. It's not. I honor age. I honor wisdom. I honor people. But I don't want you to discredit or disqualify or discount yourself. Young people, some of you in your 30s, you are going to be the spiritual mothers in this church family. And we need you to give wisdom like the Bible says. Teach women how to know Jesus, uh, love their husbands, love their kids, do the stuff the Bible says. Men, we need you to love the little boys who are going to roll into church here and have questions and figuring stuff out and making mistakes and learning dumb stuff from their friends at school. We need men. We need men, not selfish, consumed, distracted men. I'm not, not being judgmental, but we need men. We need fathers. We need spiritual uncles. We need guys like Abraham. Thank you. Rant over. All right, that felt good. All right, so let's move on. Verse 10. Now I'm telling you, take some notes on what I said just now. Someone, someone change something you're doing. We need you in this, this issue of the... The intergenerational relationships in the family of God. We need that. It's, no, it's not happening anywhere else in the culture. There's no even counterfeits of this. It's in the family of God. We need it. I just want to tell you thank you. I, I, I feel like I ranted, but so many of you, you are doing this. I just want to tell you thank you. You are doing this. You've done this for years. Sacrificially, giving your life, giving your time, putting yourself out there. Thank you. Thank you for how you've done it for me. Thank you how you've done it for my family and our church family. Let's keep reading the servant. Here he goes. He took ten camels from the camels of his master, set out with a variety of good things of his master's in his hand, and he arose and went to Mesopotamia, the city of Nahor. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. He said, O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. Did you guys just hear that cool prayer? This is the employee begging God for favor for his employer. How many of you guys think politics doesn't solve everything in the workplace? I'm telling you what, Jesus Christ, the word of God, solves so much more than just our same repetitive political argument. That always wants to turn employer against employee and employee against employer. It's all the rich people's fault. It's all the poor people's fault. They're lazy, they're victims, they're greedy, they're jealous. I'm sorry, sometimes the Bible just puts it straight that it's a heart issue, it's a sin issue. I'm just thankful today. We get to see an employee just putting himself out there for his master, his, his uh, employer. It's really cool. That is a biblical theme we see throughout the scriptures. And it's what sets God's people apart in the workplace, is honor, is care. You guys do this. I just want to read a little verse real quick from the New Testament. This is from Apostle Paul. He said, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, not people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, Work heartily as for the Lord, not for men. Knowing from the Lord you'll receive the inheritance as your reward. You're serving the Lord Christ. So I just think that's a beautiful thing when we see this in Scripture. I like to point it out that God's people, they stand out in the workplace because they honor whoever they're working for. They honor whoever they're working for. That's what this servant is doing. And God's going to bless him and his master. So he goes, Behold, I'm standing by the spring. The daughters of men of the city, they're coming out to draw water. He's praying. He's mid-prayer. Hey guys, we're wrapping up. You guys have been doing great. I'm, I'm going to bring it to a close pretty soon. We're going to part two of this. It's a big, beautiful love story. And he says, Now may it be, God, that the girl to whom I say, Please let down your jar so I may drink. And whoever, if she answers and says, Drink, and I will water your camels also. May she be the one whom you've appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you've shown your loving kindness to my master. Next verse says, Before he had finished speaking. I love that. Before he finished speaking, behold, Rebecca. Aww. Everyone go, aww. Yeah, you know Rebecca. You know the story. She's wonderful. Who was born to Bethel, the son of Milcah, wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. Girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had had relations with her, and she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Where do I even start right now? I'm telling you what, we're going to have a lot to unpack next week in this beautiful unfolding romance, but I want to wrap up with a couple final statements. One is, did you guys see how before he finished speaking, Rebecca came out? I just love that because I've been already pondering that. That's how my life works. Does anyone, you ever had this before? Before you even start, stop praying. You just start praying and God answers it. This is how my life works. I give you so many examples. I'm just like, by the time I can put my prayers into clear words, Bam. And maybe not always in that like 
literal moment, but I do have moments where that happens. One of our, one of our cool family stories, we we're at the, uh, we're at this, what's the beach called, Spooner's Cove? And you know, we, we like to go there and find little treasures. And one of the coolest things is you find an Indian arrowhead. You guys ever found those? Yeah, and my wife literally, 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 literally says, Jubilee, keep your eye out for Indian arrowheads. And she reaches down and picks this beautiful big one up that we still have and goes, I already found one. Literally, and that's just a cool story for my eight, I think it was like six at the time. But I have this stuff happen in my life all the time. By the time I process the desires that God's put in my heart, I get them into words, bam, it's like God puts uh, the pedal, gas to the pedal, I don't know, an expression to say God makes it happen. And I, I just think it's the life of faith, that God knows what we need before we can even say it. He knows what we want before we can even get it out of our mouth. And that is just this beautiful thing. And it's not always that way. Sometimes you pray and it takes time. It does. Sometimes delayed prayers are better for us because they build character. Um, but man, sometimes I just love it when God just surprises us how present He is, how close He is, how real He is. And um, I also just thought it's cool, here it is, that the sign they made for this woman is that she will be super glamorous, bougie, glitzy, beautiful, just drop dead. She's going to be fresh out of the magazine. She's just walking down a runway, looking to the left, looking to the right, flicking her hair. Oh, no, it doesn't say that, sorry. It says, this is how I'll know she's the one, because she will have shown loving kindness to my master. She's going to offer to go above and beyond the request to just feed the camels. She's going to feed, wait, feed him. She's going to also water the ten camels. It's character. It's character. And I just want to say that to you in a world that is so obsessed with external appearance. And, like, don't get me wrong, I'm thankful God made our bodies. And we don't body shame around here. Our bodies are a gift. And you should learn to love the body God gave you. You should. It's a gift from God without having to do a billion things. So you should be able to say, thank you, God, for my body. But that's not the criteria here for finding the spouse. I'm just so thankful. It was character. It was generosity. It was kindness. It was hospitality. That she would go out of her way for a stranger. Somehow God downloaded to Abraham. That's the kind of woman Isaac needs. I just wanted to remind you that today. If some of you, I just think these are real things we think about as body image. I know it's not always a church topic, but it is a real topic. It comes up in your Bible. And yeah, Rebecca, she's going to be, they're going to have the love at first sight kind of meeting. That's going to be cool. But the thing that really like stands out is her generosity, her hospitality. Man, I think we should stop there today. Hey, can I tell you guys something else cool about this story? There's something really cool. I always tell you it all points to Jesus. You ready to hear how? The last chapters go back a little bit. Isaac, remember this? He walked up a hill with wood on his back. His dad's has this crazy assignment to sacrifice his son, his only son, the son he loves, the first time the Bible says that. Isaac willingly endures this crazy sacrifice he's going to take. Uh, and right before God delivers a ram that's stuck in the thorns, do you guys remember this? It comes in, Isaac gets the better end of the deal. He's not sacrificed. Um, but he was willing to. And, and, then, and then the next couple chapters later, Isaac gets his bride. Do you know who else that happened to? There was this other guy in your Bible who came along about year zero AD, and he also went up the hill with wood on his back. He also, uh, like Isaac, had a, a knife raised above him. He had actually nails in his hands, nails in his feet, a spear in his side. He also found not a ram caught in thorns, but his head caught in thorns. He also willingly went to sacrifice his life, just as Isaac did. He also was the only son. He also was the promised son. He also was the son that his father loves. And guess what else happened? After Jesus gave his life and rose from the grave, you know what he got from the father? He got his bride. He got his bride. Do you know who his bride is in the Bible? It's us. It's us. It's his church. So even though these stories are actual and factual and literal, they have tremendous foreshadowing as everything in the Bible in some way points to this rescue mission of God the Father rescuing us back to himself through Jesus Christ. How many of you guys are thankful for the rescuer? We are thankful. I want to ask you wherever you're at, just stand with me today. Now the, the moral of this sermon is not be a better spouse or find a good life soulmate. Every time we open the Bible, I hope you see that God is calling us to the simple, the simple, the simple gospel of surrender. He wants our hearts, not our behavior, not our religion. Man, no one in here can, you can't fool God, you can't fake him out. None of us are perfect, we all make mistakes, but he wants our hearts. That's what he wants. And some of you, 
You know that, and I just would reiterate that to you again. God wants your heart. Maybe some of you, you've started giving God your religion. He doesn't want that from you. He wants your heart. Because if he gets your heart, he gets your life. And that's what he wants. He is the romantic. And as much as I said he's your soulmate, he might say that about you too, that you're his soulmate. He loves you deeply. I'm not saying that you complete God. I would never say that. That would be blasphemy. But he loves you deeply. So much that he would send his only son, Jesus, to die for you. To redeem you. I just want to bless you this morning. Will you receive a prayer, God? I just thank you for my friends this morning. As I pray for my friends, God, I just pray that this reality was sinking deep to their hearts, that I am loved by God, and He desires me. Sometimes I don't qualify myself as worthy, but He does, and He did. And He sent His Son to die on the cross for me, and all I have to do is receive that. God, help my heart to receive you. Help my heart to surrender to you. Help my heart to trust you. I just want to pray for people in this room who are married today. I just thank you for the married people. I just pray you would bless their marriage. I pray you would help them to remember the purpose of marriage. Ultimately, it's another thing we surrender and give to God that it may glorify Him. That it actually creates a picture of what God's like and how He loves His, his body, His family, His church. And we thank you, God, that our marriage doesn't exist just for us, but it exists for you. And a successful marriage has Jesus in the middle. God, I thank you for everyone who's single today. People single in this room want to find someone. They want to find someone to be married to. I would just pray you bless them. To trust you, to chase you, to follow you, to grow in you, to grow in their character so they don't just find the one, but they become the one. I pray for uh, all of our kids. Many of you in this room have kids. that You want to find a good spouse now or someday. And we would pray that prayer for them. Uh, that they would, God, you would bless them just like you blessed Isaac. Just like you blessed Rebecca. 